Good morning everyone and welcome to our service. Today's reading and message comes from Psalm 24, a song of David. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Cyrus Schofield, well-known American theologian, minister, and author of the Schofield Study Bible, said this, Psalm 22 is the Good Shepherd giving his life for the sheep. Psalm 23 is the Great Shepherd tenderly caring for his sheep. And Psalm 24 is the chief shepherd appearing as king to reward his sheep. He is our savior, our shepherd, and one of these days he will return as our sovereign. Psalm 24 was written by David about 1,000 years before Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem on what we now celebrate as Palm Sunday, which was four days before the Passover festival and the day on which the lamb was chosen to be sacrificed for the, for the Passover. At the time of David writing the, the Psalms, the temple had not yet been built, as that honor was to go to his son Solomon. So David had to travel 10 miles out into the country to see the Ark of the Covenant. Now David desperately wanted to have the Ark as a centerpiece for worship near him in Jerusalem. So he had 30,000 Israelites went out to move it into the city. It is suggested that that it may have been this very occasion that inspired David to write Psalm 24 in words that urge us all to see the King, seek the King, and serve the King. Matthew Henry concurs, adding that the ark being brought up to Jerusalem symbolizes Christ's entry into heaven and the welcome given to him there. There are two questions that are raised by David in Psalm 24. The first one is, who may ascend? Who may stand in his holy place? And the second one is, who is the king of glory? Let's look at the second question first. Who is the king of glory? The first two verses of Psalm 24 give us the answer to this question. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. He is the owner of everything, and He is the creator of everything. The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. At the beginning of creation, as Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 tells us, God took the man that He had created and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Through Adam, God has given mankind the responsibility to act as stewards of His creation, to care for it, manage it, oversee it and protect it. Since the earth is the Lord's and God is our ruler, to whom then is humanity accountable? We are certainly not accountable to some Swedish teenage environmental activist. We are accountable to the Lord Almighty who has been telling us for thousands of years to look after his creation. But the world in its wisdom has chosen to ignore God and His commands, and instead chosen now to go to Greta Thunberg for the hope, rather than to the King of Glory. How dare you, she said in a recent interview, come to the youth for solution to the world's environmental problems. How dare we indeed go to her and not to the King of Glory. Being held responsible and accountable to God leads us into the second question. Who can approach God? Who may stand in the holy place? 
And the answer is, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, God had appointed Uzzah and Ahiah, uh, uh, that's quite a difficult name to pronounce, to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. So the day after the Sabbath, they started moving the ark. All went well for a time. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nakan, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God, because the oxen had stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against him because of this irreverent act. And God struck him down and he died right there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. But David was also very afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? David was so afraid that he put the plan to bring the ark back to Jerusalem on hold for three months. Instead, he moved it into the house of Obed-Edom, the, the Gittite. God had prescribed the way for the ark to be transported in order to, to preserve its holiness, as it was a place where God met with man. But this had been violated. Perhaps that's when David wrote, Who can ascend? Who may stand in the holy place? If the Lord looked at us and only saw our sin, None of us would ever be able to stand in His presence. But there is a way into God's presence for the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. And that way, that way is prescribed by God. Inside the ark were ten commandments, all of which God's people had broken. Those commandments were a constant reminder of the people's sin. But over those tablets of stone, God placed a cover, the mercy seat. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would make a sacrifice and sprinkle blood onto the mercy seat. By means of that blood, the broken law was hidden from God's eyes. Through a blood offering, the sins of the people were covered. In the first part of this psalm, we are seeking the King. But in the last four verses, we see that the king actually comes to us. Someone has said, religion is man trying to find God, but Christianity is God finding man. The king has come. He has opened heaven's gates to all who want to enter. The first time that Jesus enters the city gates, he, come, he came to offer peace with God. Verse 7 says, lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors. That the king of glory may come in these words are repeated again in verse 9 it is identical to the first and so it could be a repeat of the first entrance for emphasis but it also could be a reference of a second coming a second entrance of the king in his first coming jesus came as the suffering servant in his second coming jesus will come as the conquering king in his first coming, Jesus arrived in the most humble of circumstances, a baby in a manger. In his second coming, Jesus will arrive with the armies of heaven at his side. The second coming is spoken of in great detail in Revelation 19, 11 to 16. It says, I saw the heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True, with justice and he, judge, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. David's yearning in Psalm 24 was a prayer for the King to come. It was a cry for heaven to open the gates for the most desired one to come. There is only one gate that leads to heaven. John 14, 6 reminds us 
that this gate is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we come to Him by faith. This yearning for the King to come is expressed again in Revelation 22, 20. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The question for each one of us is this. When the King enters through the open gates of heaven, will we recognize Him? And will we be with Him? Just as sure as He created this world and owns it, one of these days He will come to fill it with His glory. Let us pray. Father, You have created this universe and You sustain it according to Your will. Although we make choices and walk through the process of sanctification throughout our lives, all of our days are numbered and we thank You that You are the God of those days throughout our short lives here on earth. You are a God of mercy and grace, and we pray that all have the opportunity to hear your word before Christ returns. For this reason, we do not lose hope in others. You never give up on us, so we will never give up on anyone. In our prayers, we remember them and pray for softened hearts and open minds and ears to listen and learn. But we thank you that the transformation and restoration of souls is in your hands. Only you can change hearts, shift minds, and enlighten souls to your truth. And in obedience to the great commission you have given us, we continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. By our words and our lives, help us to testify as witnesses to the one true God, boldly proclaiming salvation through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that in your will, knowing that you hear and answer all our prayers, that you bring our loved ones, our friends, and our acquaintances into a living relationship with you. To your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.